Hello everyone and welcome to chapter 14, which covers the topic of antimicrobial drugs. In our previous chapters that we just covered, we talked about the ways in which microscopic organisms are able to cause disease, in other words, the microbial mechanisms of pathogenicity. And in this chapter, we are going to study some of the different ways in which we fight disease-causing microbes through the use of antimicrobial drugs. So an antimicrobial drug is defined as a compound that kills or inhibits the growth of microorganisms by destroying or interfering with microbial structures and enzymes. Antimicrobials can be divided into a few different categories. There are natural antimicrobials, which are compounds that have been discovered in and derived from living organisms. For example, penicillin is one such compound, which is derived from a type of mold called the penicillium genus. And as you can see in this image right here, the streaks of bacteria on this plate are inhibited by this mold growth right here, which naturally gives off the penicillin compound as a defense mechanism. So those are natural antibiotics, but there are also synthetic antimicrobials. Um, synthetic antimicrobials are drugs that are not derived from living organisms and are rather synthesized in a laboratory. Sulfa drugs are an example of a synthetic antimicrobial. And then finally, there's a hybrid category called semi-synthetic antimicrobials, which are compounds that are based on a natural antimicrobial, but they have been chemically modified to give them more advantageous properties, such as, for example, lower toxicity in humans or greater activity against their target. An example of a semi-synthetic antimicrobial is methicillin. Methicillin is a derivative of penicillin that has been chemically modified. The majority of the antimicrobial drugs that we use are either natural or semi-synthetic, and both of these are ultimately derived originally from living organisms. It turns out that over 50% of our antibiotic drugs are derived from members of a single genus of bacteria, and that genus is Streptomyces. Here in this table, we can see some examples of bacteria and fungi that are the sources of many of our more common antibiotics. At the bottom, we can see the penicillium mold, which is the source of penicillin. But we can also see how common Streptomyces is as the genus of bacteria from which chloramphenicol, tetracycline, neomycin, streptomycin, and other drugs are originally derived. Now, it might seem like there's quite a wide variety of antibiotics available looking at this table, but nonetheless, you also probably know that there has been a problem with antibiotics brewing, and that is resistance. Resistance among microbes to some of the most commonly used antibiotics has been increasing in recent years. In fact, there are multiple documented cases of infections caused by microbes that are resistant to every single antibiotic that we use in our medical system. At the same time, scientists have not been discovering new antibiotics to replace those that are no longer useful due to resistance. Here we can see a timetable displaying the rate at which different antibiotics were discovered ever since the first one, penicillin, was isolated back in 1928. After penicillin was discovered, there was a flurry of discovery of different antibiotics up through the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, and then that started to taper off. Lipopeptides were discovered in 1987, after which point we entered what is referred to as the discovery void. This chart is a little bit outdated because there has been more recently one new antibiotic discovered, um, which I'll talk about on the next slide. But it's important to note that the reason why this discovery void has taken place has nothing to do with the fact that there aren't hundreds or thousands of other antibiotics out there, but that our ability to cultivate these microbes that produce these antibiotics is so limited.
As we know, there are an estimated one trillion species of microbes, and we have only discovered thousands, which is a tiny fraction of the percentage of microbes that exist. And a major barrier to further antibiotic discovery is that many of these microscopic organisms are so fastidious or have such complex nutritional and environmental growth requirements that we haven't figured out yet how to cultivate them in a laboratory environment. But as I said, there has been one new antibiotic discovered, and that happened in 2016. The name of the antibiotic is Taxobactin. It was discovered in a species of soil microbe called Eleftheria terrae using a new special technology for cultivating these fastidious soil microbes called the iChip. So I'm going to play this video of the iChip for you um, so you can check out how it works. New potentially powerful antibiotic discovered. U.S. scientists have discovered a new class of antibiotic known as Taxobactin after screening 10,000 bacterial strains from soil. In discovering a new antibiotic, scientists filled a device containing several hundred dotted chambers with cells from different bacterium. The device, known as an eye chip, is then placed in soil to allow the bacteria to grow. Once the bacteria have been cultivated, they are placed in a petri dish and covered by a target bacteria Staph aureus. Empty zones in the petri dish mean the bacteria below has released antibiotic that prevents the growth of Staph above. The newly discovered antibiotic, known as Texobactin, kills gram-positive bacteria by binding onto them and causing the cell walls to break down. It is especially effective against bacteria that cause certain types of tuberculosis and Staphylococcus aureus, or MRSA. However, Texobactin does not work against gram-negative bacteria. Such bacteria include those that cause cholera and gonorrhea. So the development of the eye chip and the discovery of Taxobactin is a step in the right direction towards overcoming the problem of antibiotic resistance. And uh, it's also worth noting that there has also been another discovery in 2017 of a semi-synthetic derivative of vancomycin that has sort of been chemically revamped to be more powerful than the previous version of, version of vancomycin that has been used. Um, so there has been some development in this area. However, a lot more development needs to be done in order to overcome the rate of resistance at which microbes are adapting to antibiotics. And at the end of this lecture, we are going to talk about some of the mechanisms by which microbes do adapt to our drugs. But before we do that, we are going to go over some general properties of antimicrobials and also talk about the mechanisms by which the antimicrobials target and destroy microbes. One important feature of antimicrobial agents is something called selective toxicity. Selective toxicity refers to the fact that a drug needs to be toxic for the microbes, but not to humans. So this is a very basic and logical property of a drug. It needs to kill the microbes, but it needs to not kill the person taking the drug. So this means that when developing a drug, it's important to target unique features of a microbe, um, such as, for example, their cell wall. Cell walls are a common selectively toxic target of drugs because animal cells, our cells, do not have cell walls, and therefore compounds that are designed to target and destroy cell walls should have little effect on our cells. Ribosomes are another very common target. And that's because, as you may remember, the structure of ribosomes found in prokaryotic cells, bacteria, is different from the structure found in eukaryotic cells. So many drugs have been developed that target the unique structure of prokaryotic ribosomes and have little effect on the eukaryotic ribosome. Unique metabolic enzymes are also a common target. There are many enzymes found in bacteria that are not found in human cells. And when those enzymes are uh, able to be inhibited by a drug, it will have little impact on our cells. Another property of antimicrobials is their spectrum of activity. You've probably heard before that there are such things as broad spectrum and narrow spectrum antibiotics. 
Narrow spectrum antibiotics are those that affect only a certain type of bacteria. For example, polymyxins are only effective against gram negative species of bacteria. Broad spectrum antibiotics are those that affect a wide range of bacteria. For example, tetracycline is effective against both gram positive and gram negative species. This figure right here gives you a nice visual picture of how broad versus narrow the activity spectrum is for some common antibiotics. So for example, um, we can see polymyxins have a very narrow spectrum here, whereas tetracyclines have a very broad spectrum. It may seem like it's better to have a broad spectrum versus a narrow spectrum. However, the use of broad spectrum antibiotics can lead to something called a super infection. A super infection is a secondary infection that develops when a broad spectrum antibiotic treatment course kills not only the target bacteria, but other bacteria, beneficial bacteria, commensal bacteria that are found in the body. And these, these organisms actually have a protective effect because by having these, these mutualistic and commensal bacteria in the body, they will compete with pathogens for resources and space. And when those good microbes are diminished, it can give the bad microbes the opportunity to develop into an infection because they've lost their competition. So super infections are a risk when using broad spectrum antibiotic treatment. Some examples, uh, or rather one example of a super infection that can develop after broad spectrum antibiotics treatment is C. diff, which we'll talk more about later. When it comes to administering antimicrobials, the dosage is very important. The dosage is the amount of medication giving, given during a certain time interval. Dosage is calculated based on a few variables. They include the age of the patient, their body mass, the half-life of the drug, and other individual considerations that apply to individual patients. The mass of a patient can determine how much drug is needed to disseminate throughout the body, and the half-life of the drug determines how quickly the drug is broken down once it enters the body. Optimum dosing will maximize the effect of the drug against the microbes while also minimizing the toxicity and side effects of the drugs for the patient. There are a few common ways of administering antimicrobial drugs. Perhaps the most common way is oral administration through tablets or capsules. Oral administration is more convenient because people can do it at home on their own time, but the results of oral administration are a lower level of plasma concentration of the drug, which of course can translate to lower levels of the drug reaching the site of the infection in the body. Intravenous, or in other words IV, or intramuscular, in other words IM, administration is of course less convenient, but it results in a higher plasma level of the drug. Intravenous or intramuscular administration is a good option for drugs that are not absorbed well by the gastrointestinal tract, and therefore oral administration presents some problems. And it's also used for patients who cannot take oral medications for one reason or another. So now that we've covered some of the basics of antimicrobials, we are going to look at a few different classes of antimicrobials based upon what type of microbe they are designed to target because each type of pathogenic microscopic organism has its own class of drugs that is dedicated to targeting it. Antibiotics are also known as antibacterial drugs, drugs that fight and target antibiotics, or pardon me, <laughs> drugs that fight and target bacteria. Um, then there's antifungal drugs, drugs that fight and target fungus, antiviral drugs, drugs that fight and target viruses, antiprotozoan drugs, and antihelminthic drugs. So we're going to start with antibiotics, or in other words, antibacterial drugs. There are five common mechanisms by which antibiotics work to destroy bacterial cells. Those are inhibition of cell wall synthesis, disruption of cell membrane function, 
inhibition of protein synthesis, inhibition of nucleic acid synthesis, and action as anti-metabolites, or in other words, inhibition of unique bacterial enzymes. We're going to walk through each of these briefly and take a look at some antibiotic examples that fall into each category of mechanism of action. So we'll start by taking a look at antibiotics that work through inhibition of cell wall synthesis. These antibiotics are typically effective against gram-positive species, but not gram-negative species, because they target the layer of peptidoglycan, which sits on the outside of the membrane of gram-positive species, whereas for gram-negative species, there's only a thin layer of peptidoglycan that is protected in this membrane sandwich. So there are a few different classes of antibiotics that work this way. One is the group called the beta-lactams. The beta-lactams include penicillin, as well as penicillin derivatives such as methicillin and ampicillin, as well as cephalosporin. What these antibiotics do is they competitively inhibit, meaning they bind to the active site, of the enzyme that builds peptidoglycan during the synthesis of the cell wall. As you can see in this microscopy animation right here, we have two samples of bacilli on the left side. These are the ones that are exposed to penicillin. On the right side, these are the ones that are not. We can see that on the right side, the bacilli continue to grow and divide, whereas on the left side, we can see that the cells are lysing. That's because as they grow and divide, they are not able to synthesize new cell wall material for the new cells that are produced by binary fission. And so the cells are bursting in response to osmotic pressure because they do not have effective cell walls to protect them. Another class of antibiotics that inhibit cell wall synthesis are glycopeptides. Vancomycin falls into this category, and although it also targets the peptidoglycan cell wall, it works in a slightly different way than the beta-lactams. Vancomycin binds to the protein component of peptidoglycan and prevents it from being incorporated. So in other words, instead of interfering with the enzyme that constructs peptidoglycan, vancomycin will attach to the material, the raw material that is used to make the peptidoglycan uh, cell wall and prevent it from being taken up by the enzyme. There are also uh, bacteria, namely mycobacteria, that have a different structured cell wall. You may remember that they have a layer of peptidoglycan, but outside of it, they have this layer of waxy mycolic acids which offers additional protection to these species of bacteria. Luckily, there are a few antibiotics that specifically target this waxy layer. Isoniazid is one of them, and this drug inhibits the synthesis of the mycolic acids. Ethambutol is another antibiotic that uh, prevents the mycolic acids from being incorporated into the cell wall. So this brings us to our first checkpoint. Tell me, is isoniazid a broad or a narrow spectrum antibiotic? Next, we have an, another category of inhibition, which is inhibition of protein synthesis. Drugs that inhibit the protein synthesis of bacteria exhibit broad spectrum activity because the ribosomes uh, in all bacteria have roughly the same structure. And so that means that these types of drugs work across broad classes of microbes. However, there are two different categories of protein synthesis inhibiting antibiotics. There are ones that inhibit the large subunit, or in other words, the 50S subunit of the prokaryotic ribosome. And there are ones that inhibit the small or the 30S subunit of the eukary or prokaryotic ribosome. Ones that inhibit the large subunit include macrolides, 
such as erythromycin and its uh, semi-synthetic derivative azithromycin, as well as chloramphenicol. Ones that inhibit the small 30S subunit are the aminoglycosides, streptomycin, gentamicin, and neomycin, as well as tetracyclines. We can contrast the broad spectrum of activity seen in uh, drugs that inhibit protein synthesis to the narrow spectrum of activity in drugs that inhibit cell membranes. Polymyxins are a class that bind to and disrupt the outer membrane of gram-negative species. This, of course, gives them a narrow spectrum of activity because they do not work broadly against all species of bacteria, only those that have an outer membrane which is capable of disruption in this manner. They are not selectively toxic and exhibit severe side effects when they are administered systemically because humans also have a cell membrane that is susceptible to the effects of polymyxins. Therefore, these drugs are preferred for topical infections. As you can see, we have an ophthalmic ointment over here meant to be applied, uh, for example, for conjunctivitis. So topical application of polymyxins is preferred to uh, intramuscular intravenous or oil, oral systemic application. Daptomycin is another drug in this category. This one binds to and disrupts the membrane not of gram-negative species, but of gram-positive species. So both of these are um, narrow-spectrum antibiotics, but they both work on opposite types of bacteria. The third category of antibiotics are ones that inhibit nucleic acid synthesis, or in other words, synthesis of DNA and or RNA. Rifamycin is one of these drugs, and the way that it works is by binding to the bacterial RNA polymerase enzyme. The RNA polymerase enzyme found in bacteria has a different structure than the RNA polymerase enzyme found in our cells. And in this way, the drug is selectively toxic and can inhibit the synthesis of RNA. This drug is most often used as part of the standard cocktail used to treat mycobacterial infections, along with one of the mycolic acid inhibitors that we saw previously. Ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin also fall into this category, but they work in a different way. They inhibit these bacterial enzymes called DNA gyrase and topoisomerase, which uh, are two enzymes that play a role in transitioning DNA between its relaxed stage, when it undergoes replication, and its supercoiled stage, when it is stored in the nucleus. So in order for DNA to be replicated, it needs to be relaxed and the enzymes DNA gyrase and topoisomerase alternate between these two stages. Ciprofloxacin and levofloxacin um, have a broad spectrum of activity, and they are some of the most commonly used antibiotics for treating a wide range of infections. Now, the last mechanism of action is inhibition of metabolic pathways. Sulfa drugs, or sulfanilamides, as well as trimethoprim, are two drugs that are uh, used to inhibit a very important metabolic pathway in bacteria, which is the enzymatic pathway that leads to the production of folic acid, which is an essential, an essential nutrient for bacteria. And so these drugs are enzyme inhibitors that competitively interfere with enzymes that uh, are involved in the production of precursors for folic acid. So ultimately, they shut down the pathway that generates folic acid, which is not a pathway that we have in our cells. Therefore, this is a selectively toxic mechanism just for bacteria. And in doing so, they're able to kill the bacteria. So we have another checkpoint now. Doxycycline blocks tRNA molecules from entering the ribosome. So under what mechanism of action would this antibiotic be characterized out of the ones that we have just reviewed? And in this checkpoint, 
I'd like you to name an antibiotic that you would use to treat an infection caused by the organisms in the gram stain sample to the right. Here we can see that we have a combination of pink and purple bacilli in this sample. So this completes our discussion of antibiotics or antibacterial drugs. We're now going to move on to talking about drugs that fight fungi, viruses, protozoans, and helminths. Antifungal drugs are a bit more difficult to develop than antibacterial drugs. And the reason why is because fungi are more similar and more closely related to humans than bacteria are, and so selective toxicity is more difficult to achieve. However, there are a few targets that are commonly used to, uh, as the basis of antifungal drugs, and the most common one is ergosterol. Our cells have a steroid called cholesterol in their cell membranes, and fungi also have a steroid, but they have a different one called ergosterol. So by destroying ergosterol, this is selectively toxic because we do not have this steroid, we have cholesterol, and it's able to destroy the fungal cells. Chitin, which is the material out of which the uh, fungal cell walls are composed, is also a common target. And of course, this is selectively toxic because our cells don't have a cell wall at all. Antiviral drugs also represent a class of drugs where selective toxicity is difficult to achieve, and this is because viruses use our own cells' enzymes to reproduce. Therefore, it's difficult to inhibit viruses because they are so reliant and tied up with the machinery of our own cells that it's hard to find ways to destroy them without also destroying our cells. However, there are a few examples of antiviral drugs that have been developed that successfully target specifically viral enzymes that are unique to these types of viruses. So we're going to briefly talk about these three examples. We have acyclovir or Zovirax, oseltamivir or Tamiflu, and azidothymidine or zidovudine. So acyclovir or Zovirax is a drug that structurally is a synthetic version of guanosine, which is one of the four DNA nucleotides. We can see guanosine up here, and we can see down here a cyclovir, the structure of which is similar, but it's missing a component of the normal guanine structure. There are chemical alterations to this uh, particular synthetic nucleotide that cause it to terminate a new strand of DNA when it is incorporated. So essentially, it shuts down the production of new strands of DNA for these viruses. It is selectively toxic because the activation of a viral enzyme is required in order for this process to happen. And so this will not happen in our own cells because a special viral enzyme must activate the process of this being incorporated into a new strand of DNA. Acyclovir is commonly used to treat certain DNA viruses, especially those belonging to the herpes viridae family, including chickenpox, uh, herpes simplex virus 1, and herpes simplex virus 2. The next antiviral drug that we will talk about as an example is oseltamivir, or as you've probably heard it called, Tamiflu. Tamiflu is used to treat infections of the flu, and the way that it works is by interfering with the special protein spikes found on the surface of the flu virus called N spikes. N stands for neuraminidase. And neuraminidase is a enzyme that allows the new flu virions to bud from the host cell. So, as we've mentioned before, Tamiflu will block the spread of the infection by preventing new flu virus particles from exiting infected cells, which 
lessens the symptoms, lessens the contagiousness, and shortens the duration of the illness. Lastly, we have azidothymidine, also called zidovudine, which is used for treating HIV infections. Azidothymidine, as the name suggests, is an analog for the nucleotide thymine, which is one of the four DNA nucleotides. And as we can see in this image, it is similar in structure, in fact, almost identical in structure to thymine, with the exception of one chemical alteration down here. It is so similar to the structure of thymine that it is able to enter the active site and competitively inhibit the enzyme reverse transcriptase, which, as we have learned, is the enzyme that converts the viral HIV RNA into DNA, which is a step that is necessary as a precursor to integrating it into the host cell's genome. And so by preventing RNA from being converted into DNA, therefore integration can't take place and the extent of the HIV virus infection is lessened. In this checkpoint, I want you to explain to me why the mechanism of action that we see in oseltamivir or Tamiflu is selectively toxic. Now we're moving on to antiprotozoan drugs. Antiprotozoan drugs come in a few different categories that treat specific protozoan infections. Quinolones, including chloroquine, are a group of drugs that prevent protozoans from breaking down hemoglobin in red blood cells. So these drugs are often used to treat protozoan pathogens that have interactions with red blood cells, such as Plasmodium falciparum, the cause of malaria, and Enthamoeba histolytica, the cause of amoebic, amoebic dysentery. Pentamidine is another antiprotozoan drug, and it functions differently than the quinolins. It binds to the DNA found in a organelle that is unique to protozoans called the kinetoplast. This is used to treat specifically African sleeping sickness caused by the trypanosome, Trypanosoma brucei. Lastly, we have antihelminthic drugs, which, as you may imagine, are also difficult to achieve selective toxicity for because helminths are technically animals and so out of all of the different types of microscopic organisms, their cells are most similar to our cells. But luckily, there are a few anti-helminthic drugs that have been developed, including ivermectin. Ivermectin works by blocking neuron transmissions in the worm, which leads to paralysis and death. Praziquantel works somewhat similarly in that it causes a massive influx of calcium ions into the worm cells, which causes paralysis as well. In the final part of our lecture here, we are going to be talking about antimicrobial drug resistance, how it arises, and what the different mechanisms are by which microbes can become resistant to drugs. So, Antimicrobial resistance is a natural process that occurs somewhat inevitably because a tiny fraction of microbes, somewhere around 1 in 10 million to 1 in 100 billion, possess natural genetic mutations that make them resistant to antimicrobial drugs. That means that under the selective pressure of the antibiotics that we use to kill them, these microbes with the natural mutations are the only ones that end up surviving. Because they are the only ones that end up surviving, they are the ones that then go on to reproduce and generate future generations of microbes. And this is what causes the increase in the population of drug-resistant microbes over time. Scientists have studied the mechanisms by which microbes may develop resistance to drugs, 
and have found that they fall into a few different categories. So we're going to talk about those categories here. Some microbes have developed mechanisms that prevent their cells from taking up the drug, or they perform something called efflux. Efflux is where the cell will quickly pump the drug out if it happens to be taken in. So this is one way in which microbes can become resistant to drugs. Another way is drug modification or inactivation. What this means is that microbes may have developed a special enzyme that can break down the drug or transform it into an inert form before it can act on the cell. Target modification describes another resistance mechanism wherein the microbe evolves a different structure for the enzyme or the, the uh, compound on which the drug normally acts, and this prevents the drug from binding to, attaching to, and targeting that structure. Target mimicry is a more recent discovery whereby microbes will produce molecules that resemble the target of the drug, but they are not the target of the drug, essentially confusing the drug, allowing the drug to bind to those mimic targets, and then sequestering it so that it cannot bind to the actual target. And then finally, there's something called target overproduction. Sometimes microbes will produce so much of an enzyme that the presence of the inhibitor doesn't make a difference. The concentration of the drug can't stand up to the high production of the target that these microbes have adapted. Now in this final checkpoint here, we're going to take a look at HIV that is resistant to zidovudine, which is common enough now that scientists have actually characterized and figured out what the mechanism is by which HIV can become resistant to zidovudine. Resistant HIV has a version of the reverse transcriptase enzyme that is structurally slightly different from the normal reverse transcriptase. As you can see here, we have normal reverse transcriptase. This is the binding site for zidovudine. Resistant reverse transcriptase has a structural difference which prevents zidovudine from binding. So which mechanism of resistance that we just went over does this represent? In the very last part of this lecture, we are going to leave off on unfortunately a not very cheerful note by talking about multi-drug resistant microbes or MDR. MDR microbes are colloquially referred to as superbugs and they are strains of microorganisms that have evolved more than one resistance mechanism. They are responsible for over 2 million infections annually in the US and 23,000 deaths. One common MDR microbe is methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, also known as MRSA, pronounced MRSA. And we can see in this graph right here, the rate at which MRSA has been increasing over time between 1987 up to 2003 is a very dramatic pace. The other line on this graph represents vancomycin-resistant enterococci, or VRE, which has also been increasing. Even more recently, there's carbapenem-resistant gram-negative enterobacteriaceae, or CRE, and these are strains of bacteria that are resistant to carbapenem which is often considered the antibiotic of last resort in an infection. A few years ago in Nevada, there was the identification of a pan-resistant CRE uh, in a woman that had an infection. And pan-resistant means that this is a strain of microbe that after antibiotic susceptibility testing was found to be resistant to every single antibiotic that is used in the medical system in the United States. There was no way to treat this infection, and the woman died not long thereafter 
But these sorts of infections are unfortunately becoming more common, and we are really in a very serious arms race with microbes in order to develop new antibiotics that can treat them because this cycle of adaptation is continuous and ever ongoing. We will never be at a point where we don't have to develop new antibiotics uh, because microbes are going to keep adapting to the ones that we have. We'll leave off by mentioning three of the major factors by which antibiotic resistance arises. Um, behaviors and phenomena that drive this resistance and this evolution of adaptations. One of them is overuse and misuse of antibiotics. In many developing countries, antibiotics are available for purchase without a prescription. And so this means that people may take them for indications that are really not appropriate, such as the common cold, which is caused by a virus and where antibiotics would have no impact on that viral infection. Even when prescribed, the antibiotics may be given for the wrong indications. There's been some public health research that shows how um, people are becoming more insistent on receiving antibiotics after a visit to the doctor, even if it is deemed by the doctor to be, for example, a viral infection where antibiotics would not help. And so there is pressure on doctors to prescribe antibiotics by patients even when they are not appropriate. Insufficient dose regimens are also a uh, cause of antibiotic resistance. If course of courses of antibiotics are too short, this can allow bacteria to become exposed to the antibiotic compound without actually killing the bacteria, and this allows resistance to develop incrementally. So it's important when a person receives an antibiotic prescription that they take it all the way through in order to ensure that the infection is completely snuffed out and that they don't give partial uh, exposure and allow the development of resistance among those microbes. Another major factor is livestock supplementation. It may surprise you to learn that 80% of the antibiotics produced in the U.S. are not used in medicine. They are used in animal feed. And that's because the supplementation of antibiotics within animal feed allows animals to be raised in factory farm settings where they are in closer quarters. And in those close quarters, there is the threat of disease spreading more readily. However, if the animals are given a constant steady stream of antibiotics, they can be packed into those close quarters without the worry that disease will develop. And so this is another major source of antibiotic resistance. So what you can do and what you can encourage others to do is to make sure not to use uh, misuse antibiotics. Make sure to take full doses uh, and regimens of antibiotics when they are required and purchase meat that has not been supplemented with antibiotics. On that note, we are finished with chapter 14.